Hi everyone, my name is Rhiannon from Blue Dog Board Games and today we're going to be going through the games that I played in the month of January. So as you know, last year I was trying to play a game every single day of the month. I have continued that so far um, this year. Not, I'm not pushing myself to do that, I'm just sort of seeing if I fancy playing and actually I found that it is more of part of my routine now. So I have played every single day in January and I, I am continuing to in February. But that's just, it may not be a continuing thing throughout the year. But anyway, in December I played 44 hours. In January, however, this did drop a little bit down to 39 hours. That was across nine different games and I had 51 separate plays. So there were quite a few plays. And we are gonna have a look at what my most played games were. So the first one probably isn't much of a surprise to anyone uh, because this one was a, a really big part of um, last year's gaming towards the end of the year. Um, my most played game in January was Turing Machine. I played that one 17 different times, um, uh, totaling over four hours. Uh, I did like an advent challenge over December where I was trying to do the daily challenge for Turing Machine. Uh, all, th all the way up to Christmas. I did push it to the new year as well. Um, I definitely have dropped off of that. I'm not playing Turing Machine every day just because it takes at least like 15, 20 minutes to, like, by the time you've set it up and put it away and sorted out all the cards and stuff. So that does like eat into other board gaming time. So I have stopped doing that like really regularly, but it is one that I, every now and again, I do like to get out, do the daily challenge, do another one of the harder difficulty ones because I have sort of, uh, pushed into the next difficulty setting for that one, but Turing Machine is still massively up there as to one of the best games that I have played so far in the recent uh, months and years. Uh, so we'll go on to the second game. This is one that I have very recently put a playthrough out of, but I wanted to talk about it in a little bit more depth on in this format. And that game is Botoku. I played Botoku for 17 hours and that's no, um, 12 different plays in January. So if you haven't seen any of my like playthrough video or my ranking video, Botoku has become one of my favourite games of all time. And I sort of went into Botoku thinking I was going to enjoy it and like it. Uh, I mean, the, aesthetically it's like beautiful, it's one of the best looking games that I have in my collection and I've, I've seen. Uh, thematically it's really up there for me as well, I really like the sort of spirits and Japanese culture and all of those sorts of things. It, it, um, visually it's a very colourful game so it really pops but you know the solo mode is one that's not really sort of uh, anyone has a song and dance about because it is very difficult to get running, it's complicated, it requires a big portion of the time out of your turn to like prepare it and do its own thing. And so I, I thought I was going to like the game, but I thought that that might pull me out a bit, but I was really desperate to give it a go. But I absolutely love the depth of the solo mode. I think it's an absolutely phenomenal achievement and it definitely could do with streamlining in some areas. And I understand that it might not be a game for absolutely everyone, but I personally think it's brilliant. So if you are unfamiliar with Botoku, Botoku is a very large in scope worker placement that is a dice placement game with elements of lots of different bits of board gaming in so you've got a tiny little bit of deck building you've got your like dice placement you have a tiny bit of dice manipulation by trying to increase the values your dice placement and the strength of your die is determined by the value of the die so you're always trying to like increase the value of the die a little bit uh, you've got like a bit of a race aspect with the opponent as well. Um, there's just so many different things that you're trying to encapsulate in this game and it, it just turns into like this big point salad fest. And a lot of people don't like that aspect but I found that that was very very rewarding because everything you were doing felt so powerful and so uh, purposeful everything was gaining you something and it was always a really tight decision about where you were placing. Um, it was an interesting decision about where you're going to play your card before you're placing your worker on the board because if you play your card that bit's not competitive with your opponent but on the board everyone else is trying to get there as well so that bit really is. I love the amount of attention you have to 
look, keep with your opponent as well. You've really got to pay attention to what they're doing because they're going to be competing with you for those very small amount of worker spaces on the board. Um, it, all in all, it just <laughs> encapsulates an absolutely fantastic, crunchy, interesting, visually stunning game that is so satisfying to pull together. The reason why a lot of people don't really talk about it solo, I believe, is because of the amount of upkeep that the solo mode has. And when I talk about the amount of upkeep, what you're actually doing on the opponent's turn is resolving... I have a printed flow chart, basically, but straight out of the box, it comes as a single side of A4 is in the booklet the instruction booklet and you are resolving like a table of sentences. <laughs> so you are, have got steps, I think it's A to L and every single time it's their turn, you are checking step A, have they met these particular criteria? No, and then you go through B and then you continue down until you find a step that they can resolve and then you, you, you don't even stop there you then have to see what they're doing and resolve their particular action which in itself can be a little bit complicated because sometimes they place the die on the board as like a worker sometimes they don't sometimes the action they're doing is very slightly different to what you personally would be doing on your turn so there's a lot to think about there is so much there and um, as I said, I personally use like a flow chart that another Board Game Geek user has created and I find that a lot smoother to play through. Um, I, will, I will try and link that one down below if I remember because it's really useful and so thank you very much to the person that created that. So I think ultimately that is where it falls down for a lot of people and I absolutely understand that it really does sort of sometimes take you out of your turn and disrupt your sort of pattern of thinking on your turn. Uh, but I, uh, I don't, I don't know why I don't mind that in this game. I think it's because of the payoff and how competitive they feel. Because I think that this is a, an extremely well matched automa uh, to your particular skill set. Like the one that I'm playing against is the like, normal difficulty, and I've won once still. Um, but it, at the same time, like it's ju it's set just to the right pacing. It feels like they're really, really going for it, like a normal person would be, and that's just so rewarding to play against. Um, so I, I think the uh, that challenge that it presents is just so like, second to none. And there's also difficulty settings in it as well, so you can make it slightly easier. I haven't played with the easier settings because I, I quite like the way the normal plays, and you can make it harder as well if you want to. But I just think that the overall feeling of simulating another player is second to none in Botoku. I think it does a fabulous job at feeling like a, a really rewarding uh, automa to play against. And a lot of automas uh, don't manage to pull that off. They're very much sort of on the sidelines, just refreshing the board a little bit or competing with one spot or being in the way a little bit. And absolutely, that's a, another fantastic way of playing against an automa. And there's plenty of games that I play that have that in them and I really enjoy that but the, the depth that this one goes to to really simulate that experience is, um, is something that I was quite shocked at and really really appreciate. Hence why Botoku has shot up to potentially, I, I don't know whether it's got my, my the first space, there's quite a few games that are sort of competing for my number one spot and a few of them I haven't played for a very long time so I want to get that back out again to like really see where it now lies because it's been a, a reasonable period of time since I played it and so Botoku is very much in the very top tier games that I have ever played. Um, as you can tell I've just been speaking to you about it for ages but I can't stress enough that how brilliant it is. Um, but it's just not for everyone, so do not go into this game and, and purchase it for solo play if you are somebody who does not like a lot of upkeep in your solo modes. But as I said, I do have a playthrough of this one, so I will link that one down below. If you are interested in seeing my final, final thoughts and like going into the detail about all of the mechanisms and the components as well, I will sort of add to that. Um, my, my review, <laughs> when I was packing up, because I'd only got the Toku out um, over Christmas because I got it as a Christmas present and so I only packed it up at the end of my playthrough because I'd been playing it non-stop until then 
Uh, I will say when I was packing the board away, unfortunately, some of the artwork started lifting up. And so my board was actually ripping when I was trying to pop it away. And I was, I was actually really devastated. <laughs> I was really quite upset, but I did contact Devere Games and they have been very, very helpful and are hopefully sending me a replacement board. But I'll try and update you on that one um, because I haven't yet received that and it has now sort of exceeded the time period that they said it may take to arrive. And hopefully it's just, you know, post being post. I don't know where the board is coming from, but it has been a reasonable period of time now. So I really hope that I can get a replacement for that one because I think ultimately one of the main things you don't want to be destroyed in your gaming is the board. <laughs> and quite frankly, it's um, one that I don't really want to get out again at the moment because I'm afraid that the board is going to absolutely rip in half when I try and get it out again. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll update as to whether um, Devere do, do pull through, but they have been so very helpful um, through email at the moment, so fingers crossed. So actually, halfway through filming this video today, I had a delivery and it happened to be the replacement board for Botoku, so you know, scratch what I just said about wait and see. I can attest that uh, Devere Games are an absolutely phenomenal publisher and exceedingly helpful as well as taking care of you as well as being able to produce a phenomenal game. So thank you so much to Devere Games. Um, if you do have any problems with your components, I'm sure within, you know, reasonable expectations they will help you out. But as I said, this was the first time that I tried to pack the board away and unfortunately it looked like it was just old glue and got really brittle and unfortunately everything just sort of peeled away. So <laughs> that was very disappointing, but got a brand new board, so thank you so much for that. So brilliant. <laughs> So we haven't actually got many games to talk about um, in January because a lot of them are like repeats, but I'll just sort of briefly go over some of them. Um, but the next game on my list is one that I haven't really spoken about on the channel too much before. I did sort of briefly go through what I, I really like about it in um, my ranking video. I hadn't played it for a little while and I was really excited. After my ranking video, the one game that I came away um, thinking about a lot is this one and this is Trismegistus. I play Trismegistus six times um, over six hours so about an hour for each playthrough and I actually played three different solo modes for this one. Uh, this is all uh, solo plays, I didn't play it multiplayer. So if you are unfamiliar with Trismegistus this is a game based on alchemy and you are playing as a historic alchemist or chemist, if you like, and um, you are dice drafting these chemical symbols on these die to transmute or transform ingredients from one thing to another using essences to push these cubes along your board, trying to like activate different like um, tiles with bonuses on, and ultimately um, collate. Oh, I don't even know how to explain it. Um, get enough materials to complete some experiments which then unlock elements of the philosopher's stone that you are trying to build up. This game is actually quite multi-layered and I, I personally find it's one of the biggest games in my collection that I find you can trigger really cool bonuses with. So I think in the last few weeks, and I'll go into this um, in a later video, probably not today, but I think in the last few weeks I have realised that I'm much more of a short-term planner when it comes to board games. I think this is why that I'm not very good at abstract strategy games or like chess and things like that. I can plan maybe one or two moves ahead and then that's where my brain stops and I'm very lucky if I actually remember what my plan was. Whereas I think if I could, I, I'm much better and I enjoy it a lot more when I can see like one or two steps ahead and I can just get those bonuses triggered and it's a very short term uh, enjoyment for me. I really like that, I, I like those short term wins and Trisma just absolutely gives you that. I mean it is a game that ultimately does lend itself to longer term planning as well and if I ever played against somebody who was very good at long term planning I would get absolutely trounced. But this is such a rewarding game when it comes to triggering bonuses, so much so you're doing so much on your turn that I actually sometimes forget where I am in my turn because you have an element of being able to copy another person as well. So sometimes I forget if I'm copying or whether I'm halfway through my action because there's just so much that you can do and it's so rewarding constantly. 
I find Trismegistus has some really interesting decision making because not only are you trying to worry about what particular die you're drafting because the particular die you're drafting determines what material you're working with but it also is a particular colour so there's three colours you've got your red die and your black die and your white die and the colour of the die that you draft determines where you're able to transmute in your on your turn so you're only able to like process ingredients along these coloured arrows on your board if you have that coloured die. On top of that again, your element that you have drawn um, is associated with a particular type of essence and you're only able to like gain the particular type of essence that your um, uh, coloured die, sorry, your element is actually associated with, not your die colour. There, so there's lots of different things that you're trying to think about. You're trying to think about your essence, you're trying to think about the die colour, you're trying to think about the actual material itself, and it's a real careful balance there. You're also trying to worry about whether or not, because where you are drafting your die from, when you roll these die, they're sort of sorted in according to their element uh, into these little bowls on the table, or they look like bowls and um, you've got experiments that you can pick up from these various areas of the board as long as it's associated with the bowl that you've picked from and so you're also thinking about whether there's an experiment there that's going to be available to you and achievable to you because like, once again this is very much like a it's not a race game but there's definitely elements of racing up these like essence tracks to try and get these bonuses and like extra points at the end of the game so all in all, like this, this is a very multi-layered strategic game and it's something that is incredibly rewarding. As I said, this game has elements of being able to copy another player. So what happens is when your old homer or an opponent has done their turn, you're able to flip a reaction token over. You have two of them in your game. Usually you can get more uh, to be able to do a slightly lesser strong action of according to what de die they have. So if they've got a black die, you're able to transmute along your black arrow, um, or you're able to do things like get some material according to their die essence, their die element, or get an essence that's associated with their element. And so you're constantly balancing what's best interests for you, whether you can hold out for whatever die they're drafting. It encapsulates an absolutely fabulous game. I think it's incredibly, <laughs> complex and really interesting mix of different things you're trying to think about all in one go. As I said, I did play this one with three different solo modes. The solo mode that comes in the box isn't very well regarded. Um, it, it's best to treat that one as like a bit of a beat your own score game uh, with elements of like some very slight competition because it's a really non-competitive automa. I don't think I've ever lost against it. In fact, when I got this game out, I hadn't played it for months, bear in mind. I managed to pretty much triple or quadruple the score of the Automa. And you know, I'm, I'm not particularly great at board games. I, I love them, but I'm not great at them. So it, it's just not a competitive one and there's various ways you can make it harder and easier. Even if you throw everything into the difficulty and push everything to the maximum there, it's just not there in terms of being a um, a good simulated opponent. So that that is better to sort of play when you're wanting to relearn the game or just want a little bit of more lighthearted, do your own thing type of thing and see if you can beat your previous score. Um, I have also printed off two fan-made automas. One of them, I can't remember who they were, but I found it years ago. Um, and that one sort of elevates it a little bit. It's still, I think, a little bit simplistic for me, um, but I have found another one as well, and that one is a lot better. I played it on the easy setting and uh, I won quite substantially again, so I pushed it up in difficulty and got absolutely walloped. So that uh, is a really, really flexible game in terms of how you want to play. So many people have put a lot of time and effort into making these solo modes uh, with very minimal you don't even need to like print anything. I like to personally print the rules off so I have it in front of me and I don't need to refer to my phone. But um, most of these you don't really need to print anything off in extra at all so that is even better. I believe this one sort of goes under a lot of people's radar because it is like, older and <laughs> compared to a lot of games nowadays a lot less visually pleasing. 
it is definitely not much of a looker on the table it's all very gray and beige um, also there's some like weird color choices so you've got your like red experiments your fire experiments your earth experiments your water experiments but the air experiments obviously air doesn't really have a color so they've chosen black to be the like, air experiment color but on the board and on your like philosopher's stone area on your player board that's represented as yellow so there is a little bit of a mismatch in terms of uh, like consistency when you, you are looking for all the components uh, also it's just very simplistic in terms of art style I think personally the player boards look very nice they're a bit dark but it looks perfectly acceptable <laughs> so the cards throughout the game also just look a little bit the artwork on the cards does sort of let it down a little bit so like there's nothing actually wrong when you actually look at the experiment cards themselves they look perfectly fine but you've got level one level two and level three experiments you would have expected to see some sort of like progression of how the artwork changes from those so there's a distinguishing factor between the level one level two and level three but they're all exactly the same and even like just drawing one fire experiment to another fire experiment if they're both level one they look the same and so that's just something that you don't see nowadays uh, you would want that to be pushed a little bit more if it was released now it's not a massively old game so I, I think it was just like a maybe like a lower budget game but you know when when you look at the actual gameplay of it it's absolutely great I absolutely love it and I, I think it would be one that would definitely benefit from a second printing to really elevate it into the fabulous category because I just think aesthetically that's just where it is let down unfortunately <laughs> I still have a really fabulous time with it I love Tris Magistus so the only other game today that I wanted to go through was one that I have also got a playthrough out of very recently this is a copy that was actually provided for me by uh, Chris at Diary of a Lincoln Geek so thank you so much for Chris for lending me that game and I will have a written review of this one coming out as well so when that one is published I will pop the link down below so you can have a read through if you wanted to know a little bit more about that or prefer to read your reviews instead of listening to people waffle on like me so this one I played six times in January over four hours and I did play that one multiplayer as well I think um, my video was released after I played my multiplayer game and this is Solar Storm this is the deluxe edition of Solar Storm so if you are unfamiliar with Solar Storm Solar Storm is what I think a better version of pandemic in a different setting so <laughs> I'm not like a massive pandemic fan I, I used to like it like coming into the hobby first of all and it's fine as like a starter game I personally think but I just think there's so much better there's so many better games out there and now I am talking about the base game pandemic I haven't played any of the like fancy editions or like re-implementations I have played season one of the legacy version and I had the same feelings about that it was fine didn't do much for me but solar storm i find actually is a much more streamlined quicker playing easier to get going game that plays in half the time and so i just think that that just ticks so many more boxes for a lot of people when what they're looking for in a little co-op game in solar storm you are when you're playing solo you're controlling three meeples and you are moving around this three by three grid which is your like spaceship trying to divert power from each of these rooms back to the energy core of your ship to try and get away from the solar storm as you're heading towards the sun to collide with it it is a like a, a resource collection game and these resources are uh, from cards that you draw from this deck and so when you're like moving around these rooms you're trying to repair um, the the rooms that are taking damage over time through discarding resources but you're also trying to redirect their power when they're fully repaired by also discarding a different set of resources so there's a lot of like resource turnover each of these rooms also has like a special power that you can activate when these rooms are fully like, repaired and some of these powers can be really quite cool so you're able to like shield other rooms from damage or you can move other people around the board and things like that so as i said this one plays in about half an hour and i think that that is just like a, a really good time for this sort of game it's not doing anything really new or really exciting or you know anything different that you've seen before but this is just pulling all of those elements together in a really tight neat small package this box is tiny and the components look really nice everything's really high quality the pictures that you'll see are uh, from the b-roll here are 
uh, the deluxe edition so I believe the screen printed meeples are in the deluxe edition only I think they're smaller in the retail and the player mat is a separate purchase as well but all in all this is just a really nice production and um, actually ramps up to be quite an exciting game. At the end of every one of your turns you actually have three action points on your turn so you can do your usual things like move and collect some more resources or um, discard things to like repair your room. Um, you're also able to like save your action token for your next turn so you can have a really powerful turn after which I really like. I, I think that that just gives you more flexibility of how you actually play the game um, and that's something the pandemic doesn't do or the base game pandemic so I really appreciate that aspect. I, I thought that that was really nice. At the end of each one of your turns after you've spent those action points you are drawing a card to see what rooms in your ship are being damaged and it gets progressively more difficult throughout the game so at the beginning of the game you're only drawing a card which has one room on it but then it progresses to two and then up to three and so I think that that actually it paces the game quite well and it, it does definitely bottleneck at a certain point to like really ramp up that tension. Uh, there is, once you've like got, got through all of that deck, your rooms stop being damaged and you reveal the whole breach card which means you're rolling a die and the, the value of the die that you roll determines how many cards you are discarding from your resource deck and once that deck is depleted you lose the game unless you have managed to divert all the power in beforehand. I personally find that it's a bit of a strange ebb and flow in this game. Like I think that it, the tension ramps up and up and up until you reach that whole breach card and then suddenly there is a switch that you can it'll be a little bit more relaxed because your rooms aren't being damaged. Uh, again, you lose the game if any room takes a fourth damage. They can take up to three damage and they're still alive essentially, but the fourth damage destroys the room and your ship goes down. So. I find that a very strange like balance or, or like balance of how thematic it is versus how it speeds the game along. It does a great job at speeding the game along and keeping it nice and quick and tidy experience but I just find that it just definitely drops off in terms of excitement at that point. Um, but overall Solar Storm is a really nifty little game. I, I enjoyed it quite a lot. I'm not really a space person and I've definitely I found um, co-op games do tend to feel a lot more repetitive than they used to to me. Uh, I, I need to be quite excited about a new concept of a, so, of a cooperative game to be incentivized to play it. So the whole package of simplest co-op game versus space theme didn't really overall excite me from the off but I was actually really quite pleasantly, pleasantly surprised with this one. I did enjoy the experience and two player as well um, playing it with my husband we had a really good time. I thought it was maybe a little easier because you uh, instead of controlling the three characters you just controlled each one and so I think it was slightly easier in that you could return to your own I'm not really sure what I'm saying return to your own like uh, actions earlier so it's, it's difficult when you've got three on the board because they're all sort of spatially spread out or they should m maybe be and so if there's some damage being done in the far left corner or the far right corner y you need to and you you go up there ready to like deal with it for the, your next turn but that means you've got two other people's turns to get through and hope that the room doesn't get damaged again before you can return to it whereas you've got a quicker turnover of your turns and you have only got one turn between each turn when you're playing two player. So I found that was a very slightly easier but we definitely, we, we played it twice actually, we played it once we lost to, and the second time we won. So I think it's very very marginally easier but it was a really fun little game and that was Solar Storm. So that is basically all I wanted to talk about today in terms of new games that I haven't really spoken about on the channel. Uh, the only other games that I played in uh, January, because you're like, this math doesn't math up. Um, I played Cascadia four times uh, over two hours. I'm continuing the, uh, in fact, I don't know, even know if I've spoken about Cascadia in depth on the, um, on my blog channel. But um, maybe I'll go into it in a bit more depth when I've gone through a few more of the solo scenarios because I've been playing through them. I'm now past the like easy ones at the beginning. <laughs> easy. <laughs> I've only just like got the target scores uh, a few times. 
And so I think it will be a little more interesting to sort of go into it in a bit more depth once uh, I've explored the more interesting scoring criteria a little bit more. Uh, but I played that one for two hours, so it's a really nice little quick game. Uh, I will not speak about the next one that I've, I've played this one three times over three hours, so it takes about an hour per play. But this is one that I... Um, I will need to mark as sponsored content because I have been given this game by a publisher and so I will be producing a playthrough of this one in the next few weeks and doing a final thoughts and that will be classed as sponsored content but I have not been paid or sponsored to do that video. Um, I don't accept payment or anything like that for anything that I do but it is one that unfortunately I will need to mark as such because YouTube is silly and doesn't let you really mark things as they should be so i won't speak about that one here the next one is grand austria hotel i played that one two player with my husband uh, uh, only over an hour fabulous game it's one of the top games in my collection coffee roaster i played for 47 minutes as well although <laughs> this one i i think it was a really rubbish sunday it was a sunday morning i think it was it was really rainy and cold and i, I was just feeling really naff i was like you know what Coffee Roaster is going to be a really, really cosy little game. I got it all out, played the game, and then I started reading some of the like flavour text on the back. <laughs> flavour text, haha. <laughs> um, and it was it was really nice because it gives you like a bit of a background of the particular coffee you're trying to brew, and it tells you where it's from, and any little interesting facts about it. But fortunately, I picked up one that was actually really quite de depressing. It was talking about. I won't even go into detail because it's very sad, but it's, it's to do with you are feeding these animals, I think in South Asia or something like that, these coffee beans and the, the way they process them and poop them out makes them like taste in a certain way. And so that it was all about the farming of these animals and it was really horrendous. And I went down a nice rabbit hole there after oh, my little cozy Sunday morning board gaming. So that was a bit of a downer, but anyway, let's move on. Uh, the very final game that I played in January is Keystone North America, of course. Um, I carried on my little solo campaign, 36 minutes, and I'm very excited about the upcoming release of their second edition. I know a lot of people were a little bit upset about the fact that they're releasing their expansion with the second edition uh, artwork changes. Uh, I do sort of understand where they're coming from though, because I think they have definitely had quite a, an evolution since they released that game. Um, I think they have just sort of like progressed beyond like Keystone North America was their very in initial first ever game and so I, I do understand their want to update it and with like their new like finances that they may have behind them that's what I can just imagine being in their heads and they want to sort of update that into making it into a very aesthetically visually pleasing <laughs> game experience not that Keystone North America isn't visually ple pleasing anyway but Maybe that is why, but I do, I do understand. Because like me, um, I'm now considering like, do I get rid of my old edition and just go all in on the second edition, which I, I may do, but yeah, it's just one of those things, one of those things. But anyway, that is, that is the month of January. So not too many to get new games to talk about. Once again, I, I may not do like a February one. I don't know, we'll see how many like new games I have to speak about. I, I may stretch into like a two monthly thing, but hopefully this one's nice and short and sweet. But thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed going through the games I played in January. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel and you'll be let know of any future releases that I do. Otherwise have a lovely rest of your day and I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.